So tonight we have uh, John and Tim from Chattanooga Whiskey. I've sat through one of these before. Uh, they're super excited. They're super exciting and they're fun to do. They do a great job and they have a phenomenal product. Um, so on top of that, we also raised uh, $400 for Shoes for the Shoeless here in Dayton. Uh, everybody paid 10 bucks. All those proceeds will go directly to Shoes for the Shoeless here in Dayton, which helps kids get shoes that obviously don't have them. Um, and that's about it, man. So I'm going to turn it over to John, let him, let him do his thing. Let him start calling people out for questions and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the whiskey. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, I'm John. I head up sales for Chattanooga whiskey coming up on eight years. We've uh, we pivoted during the pandemic and started doing a lot of these zoom tastings with various bourbon societies across uh, our 14 markets uh, and some beyond. Uh, we've had a lot of fun doing these and just uh Touch on a few things. We opened up Ohio last October, um, and it's been an incredible market for us. Uh, so we hope that some of you have, have been, able, been able to try the product, but by a show of hands, how many of you guys have never tried Chattanooga whiskey? Perfect. <clears throat> by a show of hands, how many of you guys have ever never heard of Chattanooga whiskey? All right. Well, uh, Ohio has been awesome for us. We, uh, we love, we love what, uh, you guys are drinking up there. You guys crush our 111. what you guys are a very high proof state, our sales show it. Um, and so just how tonight's going to go, uh, we're going to run you guys through about a 15 to 20 minute, minute presentation, just on who we are, what Tennessee high malt is. For those of you who don't know, we've created our own style of straight bourbon whiskey that we've trademarked as Tennessee high malt. It's a malt forward bourbon, which is a little bit less traditional than most of the uh, larger bourbon companies you see out there. We're kind of carving our own path here in Tennessee because it's such a crowded space now that we wanted to do something different, uh, hence Tennessee high malt. So in the we'll run through the presentation. Then once, once we get to the Chattanooga Whiskey 91 slide, that's when we ask you guys to start drinking with us. Feel free to drink before, but if it's other, you know, other products, feel free to drink whatever. But when we get to 91, it makes it a little bit more fun if we can all drink the same thing at the same time. Uh, so tonight we'll run through Chattanooga Whiskey 91, Chattanooga Whiskey 111 cask. And uh, Troy was kind enough to bottle up some of our Tawny Port finish uh, for you guys, which is a highly allocated product. <clears throat> so you guys will be able to drink that tonight. It is not available in Ohio, uh, but we will get some of our barrel finishing series uh, bourbons up there in the future. Um, so with that, I'll kick it over to Tim Pearson, our founder and CEO, and we'll get the show on the road. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Troy, for uh, for having us on and um, and the great cause. We uh, anytime we have an opportunity to be a part of a, a great cause, um, we we try to jump on that and and provide a good time and uh, and really excited about our path. And I can we can get into some of that in the Q and A um, later. But uh, you know, we're in fourteen markets now and. Uh, we have, we've really like our speedometer is pegged in terms of how much we are selling versus how much we are making. It's a hundred percent, you know, everything we sell is a hundred percent Chattanooga made. And, um, it's been pretty amazing. Uh, you know, we've been building this for 10 years. We're in our, so uh, this October will be our 10 year, uh, anniversary and, um, and Tennessee high malt. <clears throat> it's our style of bourbon. And, um, and, you know, we knew that, it was going to turn some heads and that was going to take some time for people to, to understand it once they heard about it. Um, and, and so that education process has been taking place now since 2015, <clears throat> we've been developing Tennessee high mall. And then since 2019, we released it, um, into the, into distribution. And, um, and it really is, uh, it's a, it's just a huge part of our story, uh, which I'm excited to share with you guys. So, uh, without, you know, going too deep into it, let's, uh, let's jump into the slide deck and then let's do the tasting and then let's chat it up. So, uh, so we are Chattanooga whiskey guys, um, obviously founded, uh, and, and make everything here in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, uh, back in, uh, October, 2011, uh, my co-founder and I found the, uh, discovered the, the history of whiskey in Chattanooga. And that was the inspiration that started the, uh, the face, I guess you could say inspired the Facebook post 
which was what it was that got this this you know teeny tiny little snowball rolling now it's it's become a, a, a lot bigger snowball but um and a lot has happened in that <clears throat> but uh but that was the original inspiration there's a really you know deep history of distilling in, in downtown chattanooga which i'm not going to spend much time talking about tonight but um that was that was just you know people say why did you start this and, and i was it was like a couple of 30 year olds discover the history we were kind of you know uh we were bored with our jobs and we were looking for something really cool to do and so this is so we thought man like we enjoyed sipping on whiskey together and like this is what an amazing opportunity and then we found out it was illegal to distill um so that's a fun part of the story so this is a brief little timeline if you guys want to see a much uh, larger or uh, not much but a more in-depth timeline i would encourage you to visit our website at chattanoogawhiskey.com there is a larger timeline on there there's also a ton of information on all of our releases which that is a big part of our story is our releases so <clears throat> founded in 2011 sourced mgp which at the time was not mgp it was actually ldi um you know we we look, scoured the country for a great bourbon there were not a lot of third-party manufacturers back then fortunately for us ldi existed so we, we had it shipped to us and we were like, wow, what a great, what a great bourbon. We actually thought it was better than the other bourbons that we had sampled. We wanted to make a bourbon too. So we wanted to get started with that, even though we're here in Tennessee. And so we packaged it up, called it Chattanooga Whiskey and slapped a label on it that, um, that, you know, we designed to be reminiscent of the, of the pre-prohibition days. And then we called it, you know, 1816 reserve and 1816 cask. And then we had a single barrel offering as well. And, um, launched into Tennessee, Georgia, and South Carolina. At the same time, as we launched this Chattanooga Whiskey 1816 product in source from MGP, we also started our campaign. Our campaign was to change laws. We didn't really know the, the, you know, the depth or complexity of, of what was going to be required to change these laws or that they necessarily dated back to prohibition or really anything about them. So we just started having conversations and then one conversation led to another. Then all of a sudden, you know, we're talking with, you know, uh, councilmen, commissioners, and then state legislators, uh, you know, mayors, et cetera. And, uh, and, and it, and it became a much bigger deal. And it, and it is a really pretty significant part of our history. So if you Google vote whiskey, <clears throat> uh, your Google search is probably going to show that it's a lot about Chattanooga whiskey. And it's about us because this is this, we coined, we coined this phrase and, and again, it was just, you know, we didn't hire a lobbyist. It was just a couple of dudes trying to get the laws passed so that we could make whiskey here and um, ended up taking almost two years to get done. Uh, we had to form new bills to do it. And when we finally changed the laws, even though we did just want to change it for Chattanooga, we really didn't have that option. We had to change it for the entire state of Tennessee. We ended up changing distilling laws across uh, the majority of the 95 counties in Tennessee. <clears throat> and that opened up distilling, craft distilling across the, the state. And it's, it's a cool part of our history. Um, so now, hey, like we, we changed the laws, uh, we can finally distill. That took us another two years to build the first distillery in Chattanooga in 100 years. And, um, and that is the Chattanooga Whiskey Experimental Distillery that we established in 2015. Which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then at tw two years after that, we established the Chattanooga Whiskey Riverfront Distillery. And... Uh, in um, 20 craft distilleries in the country. And, um, and, and again, both of these locations are in downtown Chattanooga. And then in 2019, we, we released uh, the only Tennessee high malt. So Chattanooga C91 and 111 into the markets. So when it comes to our two distillery operations, we have, um, we've got our experimental distillery that you see our tasting room here on the right-hand side of your screen. And then you'll you see the Riverfront Distillery, it's, which is our headquarters on the left-hand side of the screen. So we established the Experimental Distillery in 2015. The last distillery shut down in Chattanooga in 1915. So we say making up for 100 years of prohibition because it was 100 years um, for us to, uh, to, to bring it back officially. Uh, before we built the Experimental Distillery in 2015 and 2014, we hired Grant McCracken. 
Graham McCracken is our head distiller. We hired him to be our head distiller. He was a head brewer and head of research development for a prominent worldwide brewery, are arguably the first craft brewery uh, and biggest in the, in, in the world. And um, so it was pretty significant for him to go from that to us, directly from that to us. Um, and when he got to us, you know, he was very entrepreneurial. And I mean, that's the reason that he left that company. He wanted, he saw an opportunity to, to kind of, I mean, to, to build a name for ourselves within bourbon, whereas it was, it was going to be harder for him to do within beer um, at that time. And so, um, so he wanted to introduce specialty malts into bourbon. And it was only a hundred gallon or is only a hundred gallon pot still. So it's a hundred gallon Vendome pot still, 300 gallon fermenters, a hundred gallon cooker. Can't make very much off of it. You can only make about a barrel a week based off of, you know, three cooks, three fermentations. Um, and, you know, and then of course uh, that translates to, you know, approximately 50 barrels a year. And so because that equates to about 2,500 cases, uh, you know, a year. Um, we just said, Hey, this isn't our long-term path. Uh, and so he said, well, why don't we explore this is since, since this is really, I see this as an R and D facility. So why don't we treat it like an R and D facility and, and explore specialty malts and bourbon like no one ever has which was really, really high risk for us because we had built up a multi-thousand case brand with MGP. And, and so really high risk to, okay, now we're finally distilling four years later and we're gonna just start exploring specialty malts and bourbon. But that's what we did. So from 2015 to 2017, we explored specialty malts and bourbon. Um, every week we put away a new barrel. Uh, and literally to the point of where when we got to 2017 and we built the Riverfront Distillery, we didn't have a recipe yet to to scale up because we wanted to go through our our barrel cellar and choose what we wanted to replace this mgp which was a really big deal because it's a nice three grain high rye bourbon we've done all specialty malts and to that point or to that uh, at that point we had done a hundred barrels a hundred different recipes more than a hundred different specialty malts you know 20 30 plus yeasts uh, 20, 30 plus barrel finishes and really explored recipes and what you could do with bourbon, kind of like none other. So we come through our barrel cellar and we, uh, we selected our favorite recipe to scale up and to replace 18 Chatterney Whiskey 1816. And that was barrel number 91. It was the 91st barrel distilled at the experimental distillery. Um, and throughout that process, even well before then, we were like, hey, look, we're not making Tennessee whiskey. We're not charcoal filtering. We're not just, we're making straight bourbon whiskey, but we're not from Kentucky. We gotta, we, we're, we gotta, you know, come up with our own, like our own name for what it is that we do to justify it long-term. And we coined and trademarked Tennessee high malt. So that's what we make. So it became the only Tennessee high malt. Everything we did was within Tennessee high malt in barrel number 91 was the flagship recipe we scaled up. We also scaled up about a dozen other recipes. And then since then we have continued to explore. Now we have over 350 experimental barrels that we have produced. We have released more than 50 recipes overall into the market um, since uh, 2017. Um, all right, so uh, that's a little bit about that. We can talk more about that in Q and A if you guys have any questions there. Um, so what is Tennessee High Malt? So these are the major flavor driving components of Tennessee high malt. So, uh, so for 91 and 111 specifically, and 99 rye, it's a four grain mash bill. Out of the four grains, there's three specialty malts. We do a long cold fermentation. It's a, one of the barrels is a custom toast. And then finally we finish in uh, our own unique Solera barrel. The four grain recipe for 91 and 111 is non-GMO yellow corn, malted rye, caramel malted barley, and honey malted barley. Um, the specialty malts in that are your malted rye, your caramel malted barley, and your honey malted barley. Um, it's important to note, this is not flavor adding. There is no flavor added. There is no coloring added. This is a straight bourbon whiskey defined by the TTB. 
um, our, but, but because we utilized so many specialty malts that have been roasted and toasted and caramelized and smoked, et cetera, we have a very kind of dark, deep, dark, rich, complex flavor profile. We're like the dark chocolate to the everyday, you know, bourbons, milk chocolate. And that's what we were after. We were after that uh, kind of ri that rich complexity. Because we put so much into our recipe with a specialty malt, so we want to preserve that. And we want to amplify it. So we do a fermentation that is twice as long as pretty much every other fermentation in the industry. If every other bourbon is fermenting for three days at 90 to 100 degrees to 6% alcohol by volume, we're going seven days. Sorry, guys, there is a train behind me. It'll uh, eventually pass. So it might break me up a little bit. I mean, it's not the Chattanooga Choo Choo, but it's the next best thing. So, um, so seven day fermentation. Reason we do it is because a short hot fermentation has really loud yeast esterification. That's really the only esterification you get out of it is uh, just really yeast esterification forward, kind of banana forward. With a long cold fermentation, you get up to about 10% ABV and you know there, your yeast esterification is not so pronounced. Uh, in fact, you have a lot of other kind of cool uh, esterification from almost a secondary fermentation that takes place because again, it's been fermenting for so long. This is a uh, this is a craft beer approach to whiskey, and I think it's a huge part of our quality and complexity. I think it's highly underrated by pretty much every other distillery out there. When it comes to our barrels, um, uh, again, like I said, so we age in fifty three gallon new American white oak barrels. We are a straight bourbon, but what's unique about our Tennessee high malt um, is that uh, half the barrels out of a batch. So those those fermenters are 3,000 gallon fermenters and they're going to yield, you know, nine to 10 barrels. Half the barrels out of a batch when we distill it, we have, we have a column and pot, Fendome stills. Um, when we distill it, it's going to yield, you know, like I said, at nine to 10, half of them go into a four char. The other half go into a three char, which is a slightly lighter char. And the three char has our own custom toast profile on it that we call Toast Profile 91 that we developed hand in hand with Independence Dave Company out of uh, Lebanon, Kentucky. So, um, with a four char, it's going to be very kind of traditional oak vanilla forward with a three char and a toast, specifically the toast, the toast is a lot more, um, con confectionery, almost like chocolate forward. And as, and so it's, it's very rich. And so when you, uh, when you, when you marry the two barrels together after they have fully matured to become straight bourbon whiskey in a 4,000 gallon white oak. <clears throat> Solera barrel with its own char, probably like a two char on the inside of it. Um, you get, you know, you're you're just you're creating additional complexity and additional richness, and that's what we're after. And uh, so this Solera barrel works a lot like a traditional Solera barrel system in that, um, you know, you've always got as as your as your you know all of your different barrels slightly different ages. Again, these are all the same recipe, but different toasts, different chars, um, different parts of the barrel house. Uh, as, they are, as they are living inside this barrel and we are bottling out of it, we never, we never pull, we never empty the barrel. The barrel stays full. So we'll only draw about 10 <clears throat> barrels worth from the Solera barrel. It holds about a hundred barrels. So we'll draw down about 10 when we do a bottling and then we'll go back and we'll select 10 more. So you can't ever perfectly extract a barrel out of it once it goes into it. In fact, the actual barrel number 91 from the experimental distillery was the 91st barrel that went into the Solera barrel. So in theory, that barrel will live on for forever in this barrel as well, or some elements of it will. So anyways, it really improves complexity and also improves consistency as well. So it's a really cool, really cool vessel. All right, so pour up your uh, samples, 91, 111, and then uh, Tawny Port. And we're gonna, we're gonna go through 91 first, then 111, then Tawny Port. Um, and so with Chattanooga Whiskey 91, guys, um, it was designed to be a really easy sipping straight bourbon whiskey that has, again, some of those malty rich, you know, some of that malty rich character, kind of the, kind of the best of both worlds. You know I mean? 111 
is kind of is really celebrates the multi rich character. Um, and I'll, and I'll touch on that in a second, but 91 is designed to be just kind of an easy sipping bourbon. Um, but it is four grains. It is three malts. It is small batch and it is Solera barrel finished. And we charge, you know, mid thirties, mid to low thirties price point per bottle, which we think is really an incredible value for everything that we put into it. But I would not call this a full flavored bourbon. I would call it a medium flavored bourbon. I mean, when I say flavored, I mean uh, bodied, not flavored. I wouldn't call it a full bodied bourbon. I would call it a medium bodied bourbon um, that has a, you know, not a, I would not say it has a long finish on it. I would say it has a medium finish on it. It is 91 proof. So it's not going to have the, the finish that, uh, you know, inherently comes from a higher proof bourbon. Um, but you're going to get some of those little like special, those, those, those malty notes out of it, like that, that would come along with something like sweet tea and honeyed toast. Uh, so you'll, you'll get touches of that. Might get a little touch of graham cracker in there. And then if you're going to get a little fruit note, there's a hint of dried apricot, which we actually think, um, in the Solera barrel helps with creates kind of a, a an additional slight fruit note to it. So, um, Again, you know, for uh, for this price point, this proof bourbon, I mean, we, we price it alongside, you know, your Woodfords, your Knob Creeks, your Four Rose Small Batches, your Elijah Craigs, <clears throat> et cetera. I could go on and on in that price point range. But, um, but for something that's just kind of crushable, but offers you really a distinct flavor profile compared to pretty much any other bourbon on your shelf. I mean, if you, if you blind taste this next to any of those bourbons I just said, um, it's going to be pretty significantly different, uh, but it's still going to taste like a bourbon. It's just going to have some of those multi rich notes in there, like the sweet tea and honey toast. Um, also makes for a great cocktail. Uh, I actually think it, it, it makes an outstanding cocktail because you taste it stands up in a, in a ginger. I mean, if you try, if any of you guys like whiskey gingers, like I love whiskey gingers. You, you should try 91 in a whiskey ginger. It's incredible. You can try 111 in a whiskey ginger too, but it might knock you on your ass. But anyways, 91, uh, 91 whiskey gingers are absolutely amazing. But old fashions, uh, I mean, all your mint juleps, whatever, all your classics, uh, it makes great cocktail fun. All right. For 111, let's pour up your 111 samples. Um. So for your 111 sample, um, what you're gonna notice immediately is that the nose, so all, everything about this is full bodied. It's all bolder. It's the same recipe. It's the same four grain, three malt recipe. One big difference that I should note aside from the proof is that this is not Solera barrel finished. 91 is Solera barrel finished. 111 is unfiltered. And when I say unfiltered, it's not like non-chill filtered. 91 is non-chill filtered. 111 is unfiltered, meaning we allow char sediment to pass through every bottle, or uh, excuse me, pass through from every barrel into every bottle. So in most bottles of 91, you will see some clump uh, in the bottom of that bottle of char um, that is, you know, that is appropriately ground up. Um, this enhances viscosity, this enhances, you know, it texture, and it just coats your palate in a very different way than 91. Hangs around for a really long time. And now the barrel forward, malt forward notes are really pronounced. And to the point to where instead of graham cracker, now you got the whole s'more. And that's, that's, we hear a lot. In fact, I didn't even make that up. I've actually heard that from a lot from, from, from many, many consumers. Like if 91 is the graham cracker, 111 is the whole s'more. And so, uh, so you know, a lot, a lot more chocolatey notes uh, in there. Um, might get hints of cinnamon as well. So, um, so yeah, so 111 is the big brother to 91. And at, and at 111 proof, an unfiltered bourbon uh, that you know, we priced this this at mid forties.
I don't know of anything in its class. I mean, there's just nothing you can really compare it to. And I love blind tasting people on 111 against other barrel forward or barrel strength products because talk about standing out in a crowd. I mean, this thing is so unique compared to your every everyday bourbon. And that's what we love about it. Um, get, you know, getting this multi rich kind of almost dessert forward character uh, out of this thing. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's move on to uh, to Tawny Port. And John, if uh, if you're sitting there and, and there's anything that I'm missing, feel free to, to hop in and let me know. I think you're spot on. You're good. All right, cool. So I know I'll just touch on this. I know you guys don't have the rye, but 99 rye, you, you may have heard of it, maybe not, but um, <clears throat> this is a really really uh, interesting complex malted rye uh we came out with over a year ago it won whiskey advocate top 20 of 2020 and it's it's you know become increasingly hard to get um we don't we don't make as much of it as we do 91 and 111 so it's it's a little more limited uh but this thing has just been an amazing seller and it's and it's from a rye i mean go read the reviews online uh about it it's pretty cool it's they speak for themselves i think very kind of rich, complex rye. Drinks more like a bourbon than a rye um, in terms of like its overall kind of rich dessert forward profile. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about Tawny Port. <clears throat> so if you guys will pour up your Tawny Port samples. By the way, John, I'm really enjoying this BIB, man. Dude, it's the first time I've ever had it on the rocks. It is awesome. It just, it's just, I just, I can see myself not getting tired of it. <clears throat> I, agree. So, I, anyway. boat. I was just telling it, my wife just walked in. That's why I had to drop off, but I let her try it. She was like, damn, <clears throat> delicious. So, Tawny Poor Guys is the intro to our barrel finishing series. When I say that, I mean it is limited. It's the kicking off the series where every year, we're going to be releasing a new barrel finishing. So we're starting with a Tawny Port. Next year is going to be something different. The year after that is going to be something different. Don't expect us to just do what everybody else is doing. Some people have said, like, man, Chattanooga Whiskey, you guys are so – you explore so hardcore beyond most any other bourbon company – <clears throat> surprised that you came out with a tawny port to begin with and i'm like no 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 no, this is not just a tawny port <clears throat> not even close to what the majority of barrel finishes are out there the tawny first of all it's tawny and and it came from the duro valley these were these these were really really high quality rich barrels that that we got and i'm not going to say that the other tawny or the other port finishes are not but starting off with, you know, a really, you know, unique, uh, bold, tawny port cask from Duro Valley. But way beyond that, <clears throat> this barrel finishing has six different mash bills in it. It's got six different high malt recipes in it, all unique to Chattanooga whiskey, all scaled up to riverfront. None of this, <clears throat> excuse me, none of this is experimental now. Everything is inspired from experimental originally before it goes to Riverfront. But, um, but these six were chosen from Riverfront and blended together uh, by our distilling team because we thought that this, we, we, they continued to create a blend that they thought would match up well with, a, with these Tawny Port barrels. So they tried dozens of blends before they got here and this is what they came up with a high rye a high wheat a high roasted and these are all you know high rye malt i should i should say the word malt high rye malt a high wheat malt a high roasted malt our barrel 91 recipe high green barley malt and high and another high wheat malt so two high wheat malts in here and and of course you know everybody's talking about weeders these days um, these are a variety of uh, a variety of different wheat malts, and even our roasted malts, a variety of different roasted malts, like you know double chocolate roasted malt, would be one example 
of a uh, of a roasted malt that we utilize. <clears throat> so this has got a ton going on behind or at the foundation of this bourbon um, that was specifically custom blended together from our different high malt recipes scaled up at Riverfront to marry up with Tawny Port. Um, so anyways, it is sold out actually in most of our markets. So if you get, you know, having, you know, getting your hands on a bottle is, is something pretty special. Um, we only did about uh, 2000 cases or so and, uh, and it went pretty quickly. And then, you know, next year again, we'll do something different. Uh, Troy, which, where did you, uh, Troy, where did you get the, where did you get port? I was pretty surprised when you had said that you had that. So I went, uh, party source right there in Kentucky. Really? But, but I initially had went, we, you know, we had talked about, I, I wanted to get the rye, um, just because the, I'm a huge fan of the rye. But when I went down, he said the same thing that you're hearing everywhere now is that they're, they're out. They, they can't keep it on stock. Um, so I just went with the port cast just because of our conversation that we had had. So awesome. Cool. Love it. Thank I you did get that. the last two though. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so anyways, we can talk more about these, uh, these recipes if you'd like, but, um, obviously not when I say not your typical barrel finish, the, the, the proof is in the pudding here. Um, or the proof is in the port. <laughs> uh, so anyways, yeah, this is, um, now this is true to Tennessee Heimel. I mean, it is still a bourbon. In fact, because like 91 and 111 is a 25, a 75, 25 breakdown, 75% non-GML, non-GML yellow corn, 25% made up of three different specialty malts and all six of these recipes are, are also the same thing. Meaning that 75, 25 breakdown, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> so this, this is 75% non GMO corn and then 25% of ton of different, uh, specialty malts. Um, you know, age for greater than three years, uh, finished for, uh, about, you know, six months. And, uh, and so, so here's some of the tastiness. So, surprisingly at 95 proof and people ask us all the time like why did you choose 95 proof like why did you uh, proof is obviously a big big topic of conversation why did you choose 91 why did you choose 111 obviously 91 was 91st barrel from experimental 111 was because <clears throat> we barrel at 115 and we needed something that we could consistently hit that was barrel forward and 111 had an awesome ring to it and then uh 99 from the rye because it's in between 91 and 111 uh but also because uh, a lot of our, all of our experimentals for the most part are 102 and we didn't want to break the, the 100 barrier with everything. We felt like 99 was a nice, you know, still full bodied rye, especially because rye is usually spicier. <clears throat> and then with Tawny Port, the reason we chose 95, we went down instead of up. We actually, I've, I've had this, I've had Tawny Port at barrel strength and it was delicious, but that Tawny, uh, we didn't want it to be overpowering. We didn't want, excuse me, we didn't want necessarily the bourbon to be overpowering. We really wanted it to, to be a nice balance um, of, you know, the, uh, of both the tawny and the bourbon, but because, uh, you know, the, the, the tawny port barrels were also super wet and we knew that it was going to have a heavy influence on it. So again, we just didn't want it to be overwhelming with, with, you know, all things. So, um, so yeah, uh, and the texture, we knew that the tawny was going to provide a lot of texture and it was going to be very full bodied, even at 95 proof. And I, and if I had to say anything, that's, that's as far as consumer reviews, that's one of the consumer reviews that I've heard a lot about that they are surprised that at 95 proof, this, uh, this bourbon is as full bodied and has as much, much mouthfeel as it actually has. Uh, some of the tasty notes, fig jam, blackberries, chocolate syrup, toasted oak, raisin. Um, so obviously a, a lot going on there. And then uh, again, price point. I mean, I think, I, I think 90 plus percent of distillers would probably come out with this at a 70 to $80 price point. We came out with it at a $45 price point. Um, very whiskey to the people and pretty much all things that we do. That's our mission. And so we try to offer, you know, awesome, uh, bourbons at a, at a, uh, you know, at a great price point. Um, so that is uh, pretty much Tony, the, the story behind, uh, the Tawny port cask. I think if you guys, 
Uh, don't so I, I don't really have anything else to touch on. Uh, so we can get into Q and A. John, um, anything you want to touch on? No, I I think you pretty much nailed it, man. We hope you guys uh, enjoy what you got to try. Again, Troy, thanks for coordinating all this and and getting samples out to everybody. Uh, with Q and A, guys, we are an open book. There are zero dumb questions. You can ask anything. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask any questions. So you guys can just unmute yourselves and, uh, you know, or whenever un unmute yourself when you have, you want to ask and take it away. Hmm. Corey Harmon, you look like Ben Roethlisberger. There you go, Troy. He's calling out people. I know. I, know. I, know. I, I wasn't better to ask a question so and then he called somebody out. I, I love he, he's great. I love it. <clears throat> what you got, Troy? So are you guys, um, I mean, obviously like, so when I sat in on the last tasting in December, uh, like not many folk up here in the Dayton area really knew about your guys' rye. Uh, but now I know that uh, like Eric Ribley, you know, <laughs> Gerald, there's, name, a bunch of, there's a bunch of guys here now that like when they travel and I hear they're going to like those States where it's available, which is where my question's going. But uh and they send you a picture and they're like, Hey, you know, what should I pick up? And I see this up in the right corner, just that, that purple label that says Chattanooga whiskey rye. And I'm like, don't worry about anything else you see me and like grab that bottle up in the right corner. Yeah. But, um, do you have any, like, um, you have any idea when the rye will be available in Ohio? Uh, so the rye will, so Ohio is unique because obviously it's a control state. Um, because rye has become so allocated in Ohio, you have to do a certain amount of revenue in the state for them to keep the product on. We don't have enough inventory to keep the market full. So the state doesn't really like that. I've talked to them about doing a special order, which shouldn't be an issue, but we're still running into allocation issues. I can tell you guys right now, um, you know, the markets that are close to you guys, we do send some to Kentucky and they are on the list uh, to receive some at the end of July. Uh, so party source would obviously be getting some, um, I would imagine there's probably going to be 15 to 25 cases going up there. And Troy, if you want to stay in touch with me, I can keep you posted on that, but put it on your calendar to reach out to me, uh, July 30th. Um, and I or actually July, the, the week of July 30th, a little before the 30th. And I should have a good answer for you of where they're going and how much. <clears throat> It's just a really good, I mean, the so the port cask is really good too, but that, that rye, man, is just that just something else. Were you guys rye drinkers before this, or did you just find this to be a, a you know, a, an easy rye to, to drink? Uh, me personally, like, um, Rittenhouse has always been like a stable for like, you know, like mixed drinks or whatever, just because the price point stuff, uh, the old granddad bottle and bond, but I actually didn't get turned on like where I was like looking for a bottle on the shelf every single time I went to a store until I had you guys' yeah. rye back in December. So awesome. I mean, since Troy called me out, I'm, I, I, Gerald and I have been, uh, changing. I, I dropped him off a couple sample, a sample of it. And I have a friend that works at Warner Robins air force base that drives through Chattanooga and picks me up bottles when she stops by. So I told her, I said, whatever you buy, just buy it off the shelf. <laughs> so I'm probably your biggest fanboy. I, I fully admit I, I'm not, I've been Troy. I fully admit to Troy. I'm, I let people, other people do bourbon picks for me because I don't have the best, the biggest palate, but I will tell you, I like what I like. And <laughs> I mean, I'm holding up my bottle. This is my one bottle I have left. And <laughs> I, I'm very, uh, I'm very stingy with it. I love it. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, wow. it's like, yeah, Eric, Eric gave me two of these little bottles, and let's just say one of them. I, was... I want to make sure you had two ounces, Gerald. I want to make sure you had a full Baby, I'm gonna, does that extra ounce is going to stay for a little while because oh, I'm a fan. But to answer your question, as far as me and rice, I started off with bourbons and found out from me generally, I lean more towards the rye because spice and the the boldness of rye has always appealed to me. But that is a very unique rye, and I love it. I absolutely love it. It's awesome, man. Well, right. if you guys have people that th swing through town or, you know, or heading south or heading north, 
that come through Chattanooga experimental should 90% of the time have it on their shelf. Obviously call ahead if you're going out of your way, but um, we try to keep them fully stocked on rye at all times. So I think I need to make a trip to Chattanooga because my cousin's on the fire department there and uh, sounds like a good excuse to come down and drink some bourbon. Hey, Troy, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for dipping into your, your private stash here for us for this uh, port. No, it wasn't uh, private. Port pick. Port pick. Um, it's pretty, it, that's pretty fantastic. I just, I'm curious, like how big of a pain in the ass is it to do business in Ohio? It's really not that bad, actually. Ohio and North Carolina, or sorry, excuse me, uh, North Carolina is a control state, and they're the worst. Like, we don't even touch that place at all. Um, Alabama is, you know, somewhat difficult, but Ohio is supposedly the loosest control state of them all. Um, again, but they have a threshold. You have to sell X amount of product through X amount of registers, um, and that's how they track your success in the market. When we launched, we weren't really sure what to expect in Ohio, but it took off um, and it was awesome to watch. So, but like I said, kind of at the beginning, Ohio is a 111 state. I mean, they goes <laughs> past strength up there. It's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it's not as difficult as most, but when it comes to allocated products, it's a little bit more tough. We drink to get drunk up here. I dig it. 111 was amazing. Thanks, dude. <clears throat> so I, I i guess i'm gonna ask because i've got i've got the bottle turned around so the I, i'll just ask the stupid question so it, i mean caramel malted rye and the chocolate chocolate malted rye so i guess i'm just trying to ask a little more about compared to what you just talked in the briefing sorry i'm in my air force mode right now the 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 presentation on that so i'll just have some just words on that yeah, you mean really what goes into them? Um, yeah. So, uh, so when it comes to malting, your specialty uh, specialty malts are really going to be driven by it's really temperature and time for the most part, and uh, and so you've got you take a, a you know any any really cereal grain you steep it in water it begins to sprout opens up there's a germination process, and then uh, and then from there. Um, you know, you kiln it and in the kilning process, based on temperature, again, based on temperature and time in the kiln, you can roast it, toast it, caramelize it, smoke it, etc. So, uh, so there's, there's a number of different, uh, I've got like a, some like motorcycle brigade going past my house right now. It's like pretty interesting. Um, so uh, so you you know that that process is is a huge driver of flavor. There is no flavor added. Again, uh, so if it's going to be lightly kilned, it's going to be more on the pale malt side. If it's going to be you know uh, a really uh, you know much more um, you know a long kilning process, higher temperature, it's going to be more on the chocolate side. And there's there's varieties uh, you know in between. Uh, and then of course, within that, you can even toss, you know, um, you know, peat moss in there and smoke it and make peated malt as well. Right. So, uh, you know, or, or, you know, uh, you know, cherry, cherry wood, um, smoked malt is, is really popular. Uh, so, um, you know, there's hundreds of different specialty malts, mm -hmm. uh, that, that craft beer utilizes, uh, but craft bourbon just has not explored uh, to that degree yet so so is that so i forget graham that you're just sorry i'm gonna i'll, I'll keep asking yeah, questions yeah, graham, my, i do that and i do that in work so so is graham the so becoming from a kind of a, a beer type craft beer thing is that kind of you get that from him just experimenting with that and doing the different malts i'm just yeah yeah i mean he's a, he's okay. actually he's a certified maltster um he wanted to, uh, you know, he, he, he knew that, uh, that specialty malts were really underutilized in bourbon. He knew that it could really uh, enrich bourbon with its uh, already, you know, uh, with, with its already naturally rich character. Um, it's expensive. I mean, you know, specialty malts are on average 10 times the cost of corn. So, you know, you do have to, it is an investment, but, uh, but, an investment we think is well worth it. 
So, is that why you guys didn't go with the uh, the Solera barrel on the 111 proof? Mm, actually, no. The reason we didn't go with Solera barrel on 111 proof is because we want all of our products to be kind of uniquely different, and we felt like you know 91 Solera barrel, uh, 111 is unfiltered, and that's really the you know the proof and, and unfiltration is really the driver there. Um, though 91 and 111 technically come from the, uh, they come from the same barrels originally. Right. Uh, Cause it's both yeah. the same recipe, but um, we just felt like, you know, 111 it's uh, 111 is also a single fermentation. And so we, uh, when I, when I say that, meaning when we pull the barrels and we bottle it, if one fermenter yields, 10 barrels, then when we bottle 10 barrels for a, for a 111 run to go out into the market, it only that batch only comes from that one fermenter. Okay. So if we sent that through the Solera barrel, then you'd be blending fermentations together, right? So uh, we didn't want to do that. We wanted we wanted to kind of celebrate the the slight unique nuances from fermentation to fermentation. I don't want to just blow smoke up your guys' ass, but this port finish is the first port finish that I've actually really enjoyed. That's awesome. That's I've tried company. a I've tried a number of them, and I've just never been a fan. And when I saw that that was part of the tasting, I was like, "Yeah, I'm probably not going to like that." This is pretty fantastic. Awesome, man. Thanks. Brian. Anything specific that you like about it? <sighs> what What I find interesting about this one is like you guys knew those barrels were going to be wet, right? So coming into it, I think you played this a little bit differently than everybody else. This is not as port forward as some of the others that I've had. Um, this is more accented by port than anything. Um, and it, it creates a really interesting flavor that I have not had before. Now my palate's not as my palate's not as defined as like Corey or Troy or some of these guys, but man, this is the first port that I've truly enjoyed. And, and I honestly, I, I'm not big of a port or sherry cask or any of those kind of, there's just not my, my thing, but this one, it's not as forward as most are, but it is fantastic. So when I did go, looking for this one and I've seen with Troy I found it down at uh, TPS because I was actually looking for the ride which I couldn't find but I mean it's it is fantastic thanks man and I, think, it, I think it's got a good blend of flavor so I really like it yeah and the it's price point <laughs> compared to everything else yeah that's what that's what I was going to touch on there's there's one thing that Tim has really stuck his roots <laughs> deep in is that you know, whiskey to the people has always been our motto. And even though the cost of goods on these products are high, because we're using two different types of barrels, we're not just fermenting for three days, we're fermenting for seven, you know, we're utilizing malt, which is a much more expensive cereal grain than most raw traditional grains. We still want this product to be affordable. You kind of, probably, you kind of, you know, the, the hype could be there if you're a, you know, a, 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 a weller or a stag or, you know, the hype's obviously there. The price point's high. And those are great products. But we want our products to appeal to the masses at all times, um, not just when they get a big paycheck and they go buy that stuff, you know. Whiskey. Yeah, and, and it's – and I mean, just – and just exploring, too, and and understanding, um, you know, while we are bourbon and we've got our rye, we, we do single malts as well. We haven't released any of those yet, except for experimentals. Um, also just the ability to, especially if you can get your hands on our experimentals, the ability to really understand the depth of what you can do with, uh, with, you know, bourbon, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, and just, and sticking to our hot, but, you know, with specialty malts, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, we want it to be affordable. We want people to be able to explore and, um, but then, you know, we're going to stick with our, like our, our flagships, you know, our core lineup, 91, 111, um, you know, uh, at 99 rye barrel finishing series. We'll switch, you know, we'll, we'll always kind of switch out. It'll be something new. And then uh, bottled and bond. will always kind of switch out and be something new. I mean, it, it, bottled and bond less than barrel finishing, but like we will switch up the recipes 
Um, you know, if there's four recipes in it, like there is in this one, one might be out one, one, you know, vintage one like fall and then, and then spring, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's something new. And so you can kind of see on here, um, you can see the, let's see where it says vintage series. And then you got you know, like your spring of 2017, uh, circled there. And then beneath that you have fall. Well, those are going to be two different recipes actually. And so every, so every spring and every fall is going to slightly vary from, uh, from recipe to recipe. So, so where, and where can you get those at your shop or? Actually, so bottle and bond will go into the market. Um, we, it begins to ship at the end of this month. It has, this is actually, this bottle came off the line yesterday. Uh, so it, it actually hasn't hit uh, distribution yet. Um, you will be able to get it at our shop. You will, you will be able to get it in, uh, in, in distribution. Spring is, is uh, eaten up by actually, I think, it, what, like five of, our, five of our 14 states, five or six of our 14 states. We're hopefully we'll get fall into more states. And then hopefully by next year, we'll be able to get spring and fall into more states. So it's probably going to be hard to find spring. Um, you might have to come to uh, Tennessee or if you're traveling through Chicago, you might get lucky. Or if you're heading down to Florida, you'll probably be able to find uh, some in, in Florida as well. Yeah, but hopefully by next year, we'll start to get some of that stuff into Ohio. Hey, Corey, they mentioned they mentioned uh, Sealbox should have bottled and bond. So if yeah. you're on the Sealbox mailing list, you should get Sealbox. hit up for BIB. I actually saw where today we uh, scheduled the shipment. So uh, we're sitting 30 cases up there. So 180 bottles. Um, it'll go fast once he shoots the email out. But uh, if you subscribe to his newsletter and subscribe to ours too, guys, ChadNugalWhiskey.com, subscribe to our newsletter. You'll have the plug on anything and everything Chattanooga Whiskey and when it's coming out. Um, he says – you said it's a limited re release. So how many uh, barrels or how many bottles? So total from this spring vintage, we have about uh, 800 cases. Um, so, you know, for us, Tennessee is, is a huge market for us. And they've been with us since the beginning when we were, you know, with 1816 and really helped us get us where we are today. So we obviously like to take care of Tennessee, but believe it or not, of course. Um, Chattanooga, Nashville, Knoxville, Georgia, Florida, Texas are all get, only getting 108 cases, and then Chicago gets 54, and then Sealbox gets 30. Um, and so, you know, Sealbox is really our only way to get product out to the people who are big Chattanooga whiskey fans right now. Um, but like Tim said, next, and then in August, we circle back with 600 cases, and then we come back in, the, in October with, I think, maybe close to 1,000. I could be wrong there, but... Um, Ohio is obviously a big priority for us. What, what we really wanted to do with Ohio was we wanted to be in there for one year with 91 and 111 before we really started to expand mm -hmm. our, our products on the shelf. Um, I think we've proven ourselves enough up there with the, uh, the ABC um, uh, to, you know, to start bringing new products in. So I, I think next year you should be able to get your hands on bottled and bond and rye. Um, not every day, but they will be. So does all your guys, does your shop have all of your stuff or is it like some of the distilleries where you can only have so many things? Believe it or not, um, it, 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 we try to have, so that'll have everything because we want anybody that's traveling, you know, to the distillery, we want you to have the best experience possible and be able to get your hands on that stuff. So we try to keep everything in stock, but stuff sells out all the time. I mean, like there's, it's 50 50 on whether or not you're going to get 99 rye when you walk into our uh, front door. Um, Tawny port sold out. Uh, actually, uh, no, there might be a couple of cases left. Um, but it's, it's, it's close to selling out. And then, um, and then, uh, you know, um, bottom and bond will definitely be there for, for a, a minute. So hopefully bottom and bond will, will always be there, but I doubt that'll be the case. But what we do also is we always try to have experiments that are wrote that are in rotation. We don't. So once an experiment is gone, it's gone for forever. But the next experiment is up. Like I said, we've done over 350 experimental barrels. So when you come to town, there's a 90 percent plus chance that when you walk in the front door, there is going to be something really special there that was developed grain to glass at the experimental experimental distillery that you cannot get anywhere else. It's, we only sell it at the experimental distillery. That's really cool. 
Yeah. Now, once you crack one of those barrels that's at the experimental distillery, do you then go ahead and replace it with that same bill and put it back and say, okay, that was at four years. Let's try it at six years. And, no. you know, or do you always just say, okay, let's just try something new. No, that pretty, barrel is done and it's gone. Pretty much. Let's try something new. Pretty much. Let's not. And now, like I said, about a dozen of those recipes, we scaled up to Riverfront. But if we didn't scale it up to Riverfront, the odds are we've moved on. So out of the 50 mm -hmm. recipes that we've released into the market, um, yeah, we've only scaled up about a dozen of them. And the other ones will never come back around. Gotcha. Now, now I, I say that, but one thing to keep in mind is, is that there is a framework to this. And so, yeah, maybe from like the opposite ends of the spectrum, they're very different. But there's a lot that is very woven together within that. So um, they're not always from like batch to batch or single barrel to single barrel. Uh, they're, not, they're not always as wildly different. Some of them have a lot of similarities, but, uh, but they, are, they are all different recipes. That is for sure. And then do you guys, as like you, you said, you have your standard blend or standard bills that you always have. Do yeah, you yeah. find honey barrels in the midst of those and say, you know what, let's set this aside and see if this is going to be something, if we let this age a couple more years, even though we want to use it in this blend, is it, do you guys find some of those as you're going through and thieving through them and stuff? We have yeah. everything. So every single release, we have, a, we have barrels where we have like, you know, a handful of distillers or employees that are like, please scale this up. We have to scale this up. This is going to be amazing. And, you know, we're like, we just don't have space for it. We just can't, we just can't scale it up. We don't have space for it. The, the, the ones we chose to scale up were because of the boxes that they checked, you know, um, obviously they checked the high malt box, but then on top of that, you have like your 91 and 111 that are going to be more approachable by the everyday consumer. And then you've got Scottish style. That's going to be, smoky and approachment and it's going to be it's going to it's going to be more desired by your your probably your scotch drinker um or maybe even irish whiskey drinker and then you've got uh you know and then you've got a weeded a wheat malt that we scaled up that's gonna you know probably be it's probably appeal to your weeded drinkers and then you've got uh a roasted malt uh recipe that was scaled up that's that's going to be a lot kind of like almost like um appeal more to like your dark roast coffee drinkers right and then you've got uh or or like or maybe even your beer stout drinkers that that's probably another uh good example I was gonna say, it sounds like you guys go back to beer a lot it seems yeah. like it really yeah. work into a lot of your things yeah there's there's a there's a lot of inspiration for that for sure yeah okay what's inter what's yeah. interesting too is like a lot of a lot of like brewers that shift over to distilling uh they don't they, they don't always put out a good product <laughs> But you guys, you know, everything from the 91 all the way up to the port cask or the rye or the 111, it's, it's a solid release. So, appreciate that. You always get I'm only a fan of the 111. I like that. That was, uh, you know, even at 111, it didn't drink at 111. It was pretty smooth and, and not a really terrible hug. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I think one thing to highlight that we don't really talk about much, but, you know, we're not scared to share it because we're, we're proud of what we've created these products are just over two years old. Um, and, you know, we wanted to release a straight bourbon whiskey. We also wanted to transition from MGP, uh, you know, to our to Tennessee High Malt. And when we ran out of our MGP stock, Tennessee High Malt was turning two years old. Um, and a lot of times when you try two-year-old bourbon, they taste green and young and grainy, and they're just, they're not ready to go. But because of the way Grant has... Um, because of Grant's craft, I would say, you know, we've created a product that hopefully people don't just harp on age. They harp on everything on the back end, whether it's the, the, the long, cold fermentation or the two different types of barrels, a single fermentation cast strength. You know, there's just all these things he's done that have really helped shape who we are. And, and I, you know, hopefully the direction we're headed. But these products will continue to get older. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're working on that now. So as you guys continue to buy Chattanooga Whiskey 91 and 111 uh, in years to come, they will just continue to get older and older and older. And stylistically too. I mean, again, we, we really, we talk a lot about style. Um, I mean, that's part of our style. There's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, you know, this is not uh, part of our style right now is to not be a six or eight year bourbon. It's just, it's just 
not necessary. It's not a necessary part of, of, uh, of everything that goes into it. We put so many other things into it. That said, you know, we've got older products. We have experimental single barrels that are pushing five years old. We've got some single malts that'll come out at six and seven years old. We've got bottle and bond coming out now at four years old. And we have older products, our <laughs> barrel finishing series, our single barrels. We don't do many of them, but you know, they're between four and five years old. But I mean, again, like we've got some older products. We just stylistically 91 and 111 at, you know, between two and three years old. And then 99 rye at between three and four years old. And and I was, it's in our barrel finishing series between three and four years. We just, it's, it just works. It works for what we're after. And so we really harp on style when, when people say age, we say style, but, uh, but yeah. Amen. Anyways. Now I, I, guys, I, I will tell you my, my aunt that lives uh, a little bit South of Dale hollow is going to probably get some more uh, visits for me so I can make a, trip down a little farther south in Chattanooga but hey I in Troy I've said this and I'll piss people off and I don't really give a shit but um <laughs> there's a lot of uh I I'm new to bourbon probably two years and I've learned there's a lot of douchebaggery in this business so hey appreciate you keeping it at a price point for the people I like that um cheers to you guys it's it's a great product I love the rye I wish I could get more but thank you Thank you for setting this up, Troy. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that, man. It's awesome. Really? That's another question. Are you guys um so are you guys just now starting to experience like uh the demand for product is and, and is that what is obviously uh, uh keeping some of it off the shelf or you know, not keeping it off the shelf, but like making it hard to find compared to just over the past six months? Yeah, I mean we've well I'll I guess my short answer is yes, but we're in 14 states. Um, it's probably surprising to most people how many cases we produce and how many cases we sell in those 14 states. Frankly, we didn't think we'd be selling as much as, as you know, really selling as much as we're making for another couple of years. It's pretty awesome to be at this place now, uh, but I can tell you that we are not expanding into any other markets. And the reason for that is because we want to continue to supply the markets that we're in. So, um, so we are going to continue to try and supply, you know, Ohio, like we're continuing to supply Tennessee to the best of our ability. Um, and in the meantime, uh, you know, our stills are, are we, we have a beautiful copper Vendome, uh, you know, uh, column that we are upgrading to a slightly larger copper Vendome column that's that's happening in July. We've got additional fermenters that are that you know, we have four 3000 gallon fermenters. We're about to drop several more uh, fermenters down. Um, you know, we're 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 expanding uh, production so that we can keep up with that. We we have no plans to go to the West Coast. We have no plans to go to the Northeast. Um, we're going to stick with where we're at and continue to supply it. Um, and so that that's our commitment. But, yeah, it's gotten gotten pretty tight <laughs> so it's a good fun. thing though yeah it's fun and do you guys do um so i had somebody message me and ask this question and i'm not asking specifically for us but that would be great in the future but um so you said that you do very few single barrels is that just because um inventory isn't there or demand it's hasn't been we do so much, so much other stuff, you know, and it's hard. Single barrels are such a pain in the ass. Um, I, it's just so hard to do. And we do, we we're doing 36 single barrels this year. And we probably had requests for between three and 400. 34. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, or 30. Yeah. Excuse me. Sorry, John. Yeah. Um, but so it, they're just really hard to do and we love them. I mean, they're cool. And it's, and, and it's a beautiful product. But we just didn't set up our operation to focus on single barrels like a lot of other companies did. And they have that luxury. They're like, hey, we're going to set this thing up to do a million single barrels. We set up our we set up our operation to to really hone in on the complexities of 91, 111, you know, 99 rye and the experimentals. I mean, we're doing like I said, we're actively releasing a dozen different whether it be an experimental single barrel or it be an experimental batch. We're, act, we're actively releasing, you know, a dozen e EXP releases every year. 
So it's just hard for us with all that we do to also do single barrels. And that's probably the main driver. And I would say too, you know, the more single barrels we do at four years, the more we're, we're holding back the age of 91 and 111. Yeah. You're taking your oldest, best product and dumping it in. That's true. Yeah. And so we want, we want 91 and 111 to continue to get older. Um, but you know, I, there, there is opportunity in the future. So don't, don't think there's not. Uh, we just got to catch up, man. We're, we're trying to stay stay alive with just 91 and 111 right now. You guys probably get this question. You were working somewhere in another area when you started this up. What was your area of expertise before you started this? And uh, what was that experience like? What did it take? Uh, before I started Chattanooga Whiskey? Yes. Um, I was working for my dad. Uh, I worked for him for about eight years. I was in manufacturing. I was in ops. Um, and then I went into product development, business development. Um, and so that's really where I found my passion was coming up with these solutions uh, and marketing these solutions that really didn't exist in the market. Um, that was my passion, really. And, um, and I did not want to work for forever uh, for, for my dad, uh, just not specifically because of my dad. I mean, my dad's an amazing guy it's because I, didn't, I wasn't really passionate about the product that we were making. And, uh, and so when I went to start this, some of that definitely carried over. Um, but you know, I was only 30 years old and, uh, you know, now I'm 40. And so my entire thirties have, has, have been Chattanooga whiskey and having, you know, two children with my wife. Um, so I would say that at 40, uh, I, I feel like I could talk a lot more about my experiences than when I was 30. Uh, but um, I didn't think I was going to start a whiskey company. I didn't have a plan to start a whiskey company. Um, but that's, that's what happened. And then really just kind of figuring everything out along the way in terms of raising capital, uh, you know, borrowing capital, um, you really like, you know, uh, building an operation, um, from nothing. I mean, uh, you know, assembling the team on and on, whatever it's, it's been, a it's been crazy. It's been, it's been, I, I did not experience most, I did not experience most of those things in my uh, former career. Um, a lot of this was, uh, was like almost just like throwing yourself in the deep end and having to learn it all yourself, you know? Uh, so I really, I, while I can attribute, I think a lot of um, passion and some, and some passion, charisma, skill set, whatnot uh, to, a good upbringing and some great parents um, as far as professionally and educationally. Uh, I mean, I did not, I did not have what I would call the experience to go start my own business. It just happened. Thanks. I think it's a good story. Thanks. I appreciate that. Are you guys from Chattanooga? Is that the reason why you chose that town or what? I am. Yeah. Actually, John is too. John and I are, are two of the, two of like the only employees out of 30 plus employees and at Chattanooga whiskey that are, that are born and raised in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So um, yeah, living downtown uh, in 05. So I graduated uh, Auburn university and um, met my wife there, built a house downtown in 05, uh, started Chattanooga whiskey in 2011. But I mean, yeah, I wanted to do something, you know, we're proud of it, man. John and I are proud of this town. Like it, it is, it is deep in our roots. How, how proud we are of Chattanooga. And it's like Chattanooga, man, it's it, it not only does it have like a really cool history, um, that dates back, you know, before the civil war and it's obviously it's a big civil war town. Uh, but it's also just, we've got a cool like modern day history too. I mean, we just kind of, we're, we're just fighters down here, man. We find ways to, to do things, um, entrepreneurially and, uh, and capitalize on, you know, the landscape and, uh, and it's a, and it's become just one of the coolest towns in America. So speaking of your facilities and stuff, um, has Tennessee opened up hundred percent now? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. As you can probably imagine, uh, you know, Tennessee, Georgia, uh, you know, Florida, they were, fairly open through most of COVID. Um, but Tennessee is, uh, is bonkers. I mean, if you come to Chattanooga, our tourism is off the charts. And if just 
listen, I love Dollywood like everybody else, but man, like if you, if you don't want to stand shoulder to shoulder in lines, uh, don't go to Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg. I mean, Nashville, I mean, Nashville, right, John? I mean, uh, Nashville, I think, is bonkers right now. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's wide open, which is great. I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah. So do you guys do at your facilities, is there any, like, food service? Like, what, what kind of things are uh, available to somebody that's going to stop in? So, um, no, no food at our distillery, at the Experimental Distillery, which is where we do tours. We don't do tours at Riverfront yet. Probably will eventually. Uh, but at Experimental, what's really cool about it is it is in a part of it's in it's in the South Side uh, historic, the historic South Side district, and uh, it is the food and bev hub of Chattanooga. Uh, you walk you walk a hundred yards. I mean, inside a hundred yards of our distillery in any direction is uh, our 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 you know with there's we've we're surrounded by probably. 20 plus locally owned awesome uh bars and restaurants cool <clears throat> so yeah very walkable town super fun if you come and visit um highly highly recommend it it'd be like you know going to visit any other cool place that you can park your car and bar hop we're uh, right across from the chattanooga choo choo i don't know if you said that Tim. i did not but you know it's got some there's some cool bars in there too so <clears throat> Your head distiller came from a beer background. So have you had so have you made any beer? Random question. Well, you make beer every day, you know, when you cook, ferment. Um, but no, no, we've never made any any beer beer. Um Grant, it's funny, I've actually asked him about that. <clears throat> I'm like, not not have you made any beer, but how, like, do you want to make any beer? And he's he's pretty quick to say no. <laughs> so uh he's, he's 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 over he's over it man he's over it <clears throat> he is over, no he lo he still loves like the guy I mean, you can't just hand him any beer you know i mean the guy digs into anything that you put in his hands right i mean like yeah. he went to one of our we have 10 plus local breweries <clears throat> he went to a local brewery the other night johnny went to odd story the other night he's like man this, i i had this i can't remember what it was but odd story is they explore a lot and he He's like, man, it was, it was on, it was like, man, it was one of the best beers I've had in years. Wow. I'm like, I'm like, dude, if Grant says that, then I try it. They, they need to go put a plaque on their wall that says Grant said that you have that, that this is one of the best beer he's had in years. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, he really is a legend, man. He's a legend mm. and in, in every <laughs> aspect of the word. So is well, there any is there anything you guys are planning through 2021, 2022 that involves like your whiskey line or anything like that that you're allowed to talk about? Well, um size bottom bond. bond. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got me. <clears throat> um I'm allowed to talk about. Let's see here. What would be like a like an older product or I mean I know like there are some eight i mean i'm, I'm not gonna say age snobs but you know uh, a lot of times when people hear that like what you what john was just talking about about it being younger but you don't taste like it doesn't taste younger no, but no. so we've got a um not nah, whatever i'll tell you guys i care uh we have a uh we've got some single malt that we've been putting away for a while and um and we didn't want to come out with it we really didn't have a place to come out with it so we've decided to let it age out. And so when it does come out, I guess it'll probably be six, at least six years old. And we decided that we were going to barrel finish a lot of it. And so um, I, I don't, I'm not a big wine drinker, just FYI. I mean, I like what I like in wine. I mean, I do enjoy wine, but I kind of like what I like. And I stick to it. So Pinot Noir, you know, like I, I like, that's really my kind of my go-to. But um, occasionally I'll have like a really nice cab and uh, I, I got to know the owner of uh, Silver Oak, which is, I think some of you've probably heard of Silver Oak wine before. It's, you know, very sought after, um, you know, American wine. And, uh, and we've got, we got a bunch of cab barrels from them and we're probably going to, we're going to finish some single malt and some cab barrels down the road. And that'll be really mm. interesting. So. What was your go-to bourbon before you created your own? 
Um, probably four rows of single barrel. I mean, I really enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, and then beyond that, I had like I had this, the Sazerac lineup back in the day. You know, I enjoyed their products. Always it's easy to you know grab a twenty three dollar bottle of Buffalo Trace. You know, um, but uh, not in Ohio. Yeah, maybe not in Ohio. Yeah. But well, back in you know however many years There's ago, it was anyways. Uh, I missed the Elmer T that was you know thirty bucks. That was that's when I first started in whiskey, and it was like just insane seeing what everything's doing now. I got a bottle one time of Elmer Teeley and it was, and I was, it was great. And it's like, you, you unobtainium now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Crazy. That's what makes me nervous about the rye stuff that you guys put out is that, um, the way that the, the bourbon market is now, like if I can't find it in the shelf in Kentucky, or the States that you guys have like released it in, if it, if it, if and when it ever comes to Ohio, like I'm just that, I just that makes me makes me nervous, man. <laughs> uh, you don't have to worry about us. Again. Well, for me, not for you guys. For you guys, that's good, you know. Yeah. Well, you're not gonna Eric, yeah, start charging eighty to one hundred and fifty bucks. I can promise you that. No, no, no. Um, Eric, are you in Alaska or something? Why isn't it get Why isn't it getting dark where you're at, man? That's like I'm. I I I am south of Dayton. I, I sit out on my patio and. I, I rebuilt this whole patio this year to enjoy myself because I'm my kids are all in college and I'm out of the house. So, yeah, it's it's it looks very know. light where you're at. It is. I'm looking to get you getting dark in Chattanooga. I'm well, going. I wasn't, ex- I wasn't expecting it to be this dark when I did the Zoom. I actually do. I could rearrange, but now I'm I'm actually I'm digging the Halloween lighting over here. I'm ready to put out my pumpkins and uh, and you know get the costumes fired up. <laughs> yeah, I haven't fired up my lights out here, but I, I will tell you, it's a uh, it's a nice night. I moved my laptop out here, put, put an extension cord to the thing, and just enjoying a some bourbon, a cigar, and I'm having a great night. John and I just enjoyed a couple of cigars on the golf course about uh, three hours ago. That's pretty sweet. I'm doing an acid toast right now, so the acid uh, Drew Estate acid toast. So it's good stuff. Awesome. So John, I guess what was your go to before you? Uh, Chattanooga. Well, I had a uh, I had a bad experience in college with Jim Beam White Label and said I'd never. Oh God, drink. Jay, you and I both. <laughs> Man, I mean, it ripped me, and I said I would never drink uh, whiskey again. And it's funny that I'm a partner in this company and I sell whiskey for a living. My college friends get a big kick out of that. Uh, but you know, Tim really introduced me to whiskey. Tim was my neighbor. Um, and I was working for a logistics company and I, I had heard about Chattanooga whiskey and uh, I was taking a sabbatical like most 24 year old kids do. And I was going to New Zealand for a year and I actually ran out in front of Tim's car, stopped him and said, the only way I'd come back from New Zealand is if, uh, is if you offered me a job, I stopped him right in the road. And uh, he ended up giving me the job the day I left for New Zealand at uh, 9 a.m. I flew out at 12 and I had a decision to make if I wanted to go for a, a, a year or go for, you know, three and a half months. And so I chose three and a half months to come back and, and work for Chattanooga Whiskey. So I wasn't a big, big whiskey guy, you know, before because of, of uh, Jim Beam. But I was introduced to Four Roses alongside Tim. And that was where my appreciation, appreciate, uh, appreciation started for it. Um, so aside from that, it, it was really Elmer T and, and Four Roses Single Barrel were like, the only two whiskeys I would buy, but again, they were in the mid thirties price point then. Um, so, I, so I will tell you when you talk about ginger earlier, it's like, uh, and Troy, Troy and I, the old grand, uh, old grand at one fourteen and, uh, and AL eight, <laughs> it's kind of a, a big, uh, it's a nice summer drink to have out on a patio. Oh yeah. So, Tim, you Tim, are kidding. Tim is a whiskey <laughs> ginger guy during the summer. It gets so hot down here. You can't just, you know, of course we do still do it, but whiskey ginger is uh, Tim's go-to drink. It, it definitely doesn't heat you up as much as it does need or, you know, even on the rocks. Well, I, so for this group, I do a monthly cocktail where I f- badly film myself, my big fat ass <laughs> in front of the screen, and I, I film myself. So I, 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 I've timed it to uh, summer. It's kind of a summery kind of bourbon because I think a lot of people don't think about bourbon in the summer. 
and and making like a summary kind of I I know Gerald I see Gerald right now going like this, but so I I've got my I've got my one I'm going to do this week for the uh, monthly post and it's uh but yeah I I really think people don't really think about it in the summer they think about it of a winter kind of cold weather and no it's I I'm trying to do that so around. got one coming for you this month this month's post. Okay. Give us a hint. Uh, it's, there's a restaurant up in a, like a little place up in Columbus that I had a, it was a grapefruit syrup and it was kind of like a sour, but they made their own grapefruit syrup. It's kind of a craft cocktail that, so it's going to be, uh, it's kind of like a brown, a brown derby restaurant out in California made with grape syrup and stuff. So love it. that's what I'm going to put out. But yeah, we, uh, our base, uh, bourbon for, I usually do is old, old granddad 114, but, uh, uh, you know, we use benchmark. We use uh, we use uh, old tub. I mean, we use what we got. So I love it, man. So, like I said, for the people, I like I like when you said that for the people. That's, mm, that's good. Us. I'm a I'm a I'm a kid from I'm a I, I describe this to people. I'm a I'm a piece of white trash that got out of East Dayton, and <laughs> I mean I I, I, I say that I, I I grew up I grew up there and. I moved out here to Mormon Cheerful Centerville. You don't know Dayton, Ohio, but I, I mean, hey, good bourbon that's inexpensive is a is a beautiful thing. I got a, I got a question for you guys. What is the go to liquor store up there? Like, where do you guys typically find your? I mean, I feel like they're all pretty similar. They are. I mean, they are. it's yeah. a controlled state, so I mean, everybody's generally got the same damn thing, and it's. It's honestly pretty annoying because if it's anything allocated, if you're not there an hour before the store opens, don't even bother going. Like oh, an hour to the same thing as we did last week. Well, it's interesting. It's a controlled state, but it seems like sometimes the north gets some gets either things before us or some additional things that maybe us in the yeah. south. Don't that may get. have to do with delivery dates more than anything. I I mean I'll agree with you. Like the. The Englewood Kroger liquor store, for instance, I think their delivery date's Tuesday, and Miami Valley Wine and Spirits is Tuesday. So it does, and I know Arrow's later in the week. So I, I mean, I think it just has to do with the delivery date that week more than. Anything. So, so most of it comes from. I mean, so there's two distribution centers. Yeah. One one comes from Columbus. So people, I think Columbus is the big hub. So yeah. like you'll have first. you'll have better luck north than you would here, but. Um, yeah, because it's a controlled state, it's kind of weird. Like during COVID, um, I honestly, I, I haven't been to a store. I've been to a store maybe three times in the past year and a half. Most of the stuff I get comes from um, where my family's from down in Kentucky, which is like Appalachia, Kentucky. Like it's kind of a honey hole. So uh, I, I don't like sharing that information. It's, I mean, like, I don't, th- I don't know if anybody would drive three and a half hours in the middle of nowhere anyways, but uh, I would. Today, yeah. today's bourbon world i think they would but um yeah here in ohio uh there's just one local down the street here in franklin uh that, that i'll go to it's just small mom and pop store so what's the okay, you see chattanooga whiskey in most of your stores i see nine uh yeah. 111 i see 111 yeah. a lot yeah yeah expanded that into 25 more stores uh in april so we should have 91 and, and uh 25 more stores here that yeah. Lisa. I'll say this, that that both of the Arrow locations, so I was looking at the OHLQ website because I was curious. I hadn't seen it north of town, but both of the Arrow locations have 91 and 111, according yeah. to the fancy website, which we all know works about 60% of the time. Yeah. Have you have you been able to try to get into the base out here? So right that's out? funny you bring that up. Yeah. Uh, the if the class six gets it, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we work with a lot of bases, um, Alabama being the one that's closest to us, and we do killer volume there. Um, how many bases are there up there? The biggest one is Wright Patterson Air Force yeah. Base, which is yeah, right in the Dayton area, and it's, I mean, it's the largest employee, largest single site employer in Ohio. It's twenty seven thousand people that work. Amen. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of us are employed by that base. State in the union. And are their prices better than everybody else? It's tax free. <laughs> It's yeah. yeah, the prices are the same, right? But it's tax free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. you could you 
you kind of have to troll through there and all of a sudden you kind of you kind of have to keep your eye out but it's yeah every now and then you find something that's oh i don't see that yeah all right good that's great to know do they have like uh like in, 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 in alabama they have tent sales where they basically bring everything out to the parking lot throw a big tent up and everyone can shop uh they do have that they yeah right pat they do i i'm not i've lost a little lock on it but yeah they do like a tent sale where you'll see like people have like i mean carts like yeah. loading up beer and stuff for the year yeah they oh, do yeah. it they used to do it once a year i don't if they've done it this year or not i haven't paid attention okay cool. are you guys moving are you guys going to move into like i don't i don't honestly that's the one thing i don't i don't know like are you guys going to move into <laughs> like the ap <laughs> classics market soon or say that again are you going to move into like the classics, like the um, military version of like a liquor store? Or I mean, our, our goals obviously are always to expand uh, within the markets that we're in. Um, it's it kind of goes back to that proving yourself, you know, model. Because you got to deal with APHIS, don't you? With a class six, you got to deal with APHIS. Yep. Yeah. So it's funny you brought that up. I was reading an email from somebody the other day about that. Uh, and so, so I, I put that, I wrote that down. Yeah. Um, you guys said Patterson Air Force Base. What was the other one? No, I well, there's, there's a lot of them in Ohio. There's a lot of guard bases that all have APs, yeah. uh, yeah, liquor yeah, stores, like stuff like that. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll make that a, a top priority for, for uh, tomorrow. The big we all need to need a request, put in a request to stop. I was going to say too, and I didn't, I, you know, I didn't yeah. want to put you guys to work, but it, it really helps us when you guys request it as well. It makes it a lot easier. So if you can track down the buyer, then keep a list of things that people request. If we get on that list, it's, it'll definitely help our chances, and I can make that happen for sure. That might increase. That might increase volume too, because like I don't think AFES can be like we're just going to do it in these fourteen states or fourteen markets. They would end up wanting to go like nationwide, which would put you out in the West Coast as well. Cool. Perfect. Hey right, guys, you guys uh, have any other last questions before we before we take off? We just want to thank you for your time. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. All right, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Right. The history and everything makes it taste better. Oh, thanks, Kevin. I just last thing by a show of hands, who likes ninety one? All right. Well, the <laughs> most. Sorry, we're gonna do the most. Who likes ninety one the most? Oh. <laughs> oh, no. oh. I like the. Point That's why one eleven sells so well up there. Who likes the one eleven most? All right. Who likes the port? That one's good. Like so, the Who one likes the rye? I haven't had the rye yet. <laughs> I just want to smell the ninety one, like all night long. That's I want to drink the 111 though. That's awesome. Maybe during, uh, maybe during yeah. bourbon and bullshit, I can get a uh, get a sample of that uh, 99 rye. Well, if anyone's swinging down through Chattanooga anytime soon, I know we got 200 plus hey. going experimental. Brian, where do you live? So I have family up in Vandalia, so I go up there quite a bit. I would be more than happy to uh, drop you off a sample. You can uh, message me on Facebook. I'll do that. Yeah, I live in Union. I we actually my my. Our first house my wife and I had was off Sweet Potato Ridge on Laurel Grove, right there by the. I live off Sweet Potato Ridge on Union Ridge or on uh, Dubner. You message me. I, I you know what I'll I, I I took some over to Gerald. I I love it. I will share it. I will drop you off a sample. Sweet, I will. You, I get up to Vandalia. Just message me. You guys are awesome, man. I appreciate everything you guys did for us tonight. This was great. This is the first uh, virtual experience I've had, and. I can't wait for the next ones. Oh, awesome. yeah. Thanks, That's man. You awesome. need to bring those uh, those uh, discs down to Chattanooga. We got a lot of discs. Oh, some disc players? Absolutely. Oh. Oh, 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 call us out. We'll be there. Come down, man. We got a lot of cool stuff to check out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd right, be a guys. great trip. Same goes for you. You make it to Ohio. We've got, uh, we got, got especially, we've got a couple amazing Perfect. courses. Well, guys, thank you so much for the support. Truly, thanks for taking time out of your night to hop on with us and, and drink uh, the only Tennessee High Malt. It's uh, guys, if you guys have any questions for us, hit us up at info at chatteringwhiskey.com. We'll get those emails. So if you guys uh, again want to want to throw any messages our way, if you're in town, let us know. We'll uh, set you set we'll set you up on a tour for free.
Oh, you're nice. Very, John, thank you. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much, dude. Thank you guys so much. Cheers to you guys. Oh, Enjoy the night. Enjoy. Roy, thanks, man. Cheers. Hey, man, thank it. you. I appreciate you taking your time out to do this tonight. Thanks, Absolutely. guys. Appreciate it. Blast. Yeah, I'll thanks, everyone. I'll email in the chat for you guys, so holler at me if you need me.